Welcome to this mini lecture giving an overview of privacy. Now we have four course objectives in our class and you notice that the word privacy appears in all of them. And so now it seems time to give you an overview of this really important concept. Some concepts from our usable security modules will also apply to privacy, but the addition is now we must address subjective norms. So for instance, with Norman's gulfs of evaluation and execution, when we think about goals, for instance, these might be influenced by social, cultural, and societal norms, or even be the primary goal we might be trying to match up. With human-centered design as well, for privacy, it's really important, for instance, with the first couple stages, that we're also trying to document and incorporate social, cultural, and societal norms of privacy. And finally, with the usability plus the CIA model, which I indicated will lead to a much more secure system, we also want to think about usability as well as confidentiality and availability and the dimensions of privacy and social, cultural, and societal norms. For instance, what does constitute confidential? How do people think about availability? And even what's satisfying, what's effective, what's efficient? Here are some privacy theories and frameworks that help us to frame these observations, contemplate research, and design some nice tools and interfaces that will help boost privacy. For instance, we should consider the historical law context. In the US, the right to privacy goes back to Warren and Brandeis in 1890. They wrote an article that summarized the idea that we all have a right to be left alone. This led to some important le US legal privacy principles. For instance, to protect the privacy of individuals against intrusive government agents to restrict access to intimate, sensitive, or confidential information, and to curtail intrusions into spaces or spheres deemed private or personal. Now in the 1960s, Alan Weston, a modern legal and policy scholar, noted that no definition of privacy is possible because privacy issues are fundamentally matters of values interests, and power. His book, Privacy and Freedom, described privacy as control. So he did try to define privacy. He said, in his view, privacy is the claim of individuals, groups, or institutions to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. So in his view, each individual is continually engaged in a personal adjustment process in which he or she balances the desire for privacy with the desire for disclosure and communication. Now, I often hear it expressed, and maybe I've also been guilty of saying this, that security is easy, privacy is a challenge. But when we talk about privacy, we have to think about what type. So for instance, data privacy is managing a lot of different imperatives. Um, for instance, with the fair information practice principles, which are summarized here and in the document that is shown at the right. These include transparency, purpose specification, individual participation, data minimization, use limitation, data quality and integrity, security, and also accountability and auditing. We also call data privacy sometimes informational privacy. Now there's another type of interpersonal privacy that we often see discussed. This is privacy in social situations. It might involve the data you give, such as when you offer your phone number, or also the data given off, and that's our observations um, of ourselves by others. Finally, we often make inferences. Others make inferences of us, and in return, we make inferences about them, things that aren't explicitly stated. Most people develop their concepts of this type of privacy in childhood, and there are some important subtypes pictured here. 
There's interpersonal privacy. A lot of times that has to do with data that is given. There's institutional privacy, so data traces that are kept in records. And also commercial privacy, a lot of times this has to do with inferred data. For instance, the profiles that data brokers can create about us based on the data that they've already collected. Finally, in politics and government, we often discuss autonomy privacy. This is the ability to conduct activities without concern of or actual observation, such as with surveillance. And in a way, this is partly why research as defined under US law requires oversight because it sometimes involves us negotiating these issues of autonomy privacy. Now, this form of privacy can conflict with other valued concepts such as journalism or secrecy. Now here too, on the right, I've reproduced a graphic from the University of California, which tries to give a an idea of how these different types of privacy might overlap. For instance, information security covers quite a few ideas in this graphic, but it's also nesting in there is information privacy. So you see represented here that security sometimes is foundational for privacy. There's also this idea overall of autonomy privacy towards the right side of the graphic and also nested within it is information privacy. So when you think about privacy, if you wanna make the best impact, sometimes focusing on information privacy might so-called give you the best bang for your buck. There's also a concept called the privacy paradox. This is when people's attitudes don't seem to match their behaviors. For instance, I have a graphic here from the Chen et al. 2021 study of Alipay users. That's a mobile payment app. A lot of people said, uh, for instance, they were very concerned about privacy, but they still visited apps say that might have violated their privacy or had very sketchy privacy policies. And this illustrates this privacy paradox where users say they're concerned about the collection and use of their personal information, and yet, they are still willingly providing personal information, often for what seems like apparently very small rewards. Then we can consider the privacy calculus. In this theory, people are making a trade-off between losses and gains. Individuals weigh the expected loss of privacy against the potential gain of disclosure. And interestingly, some studies have shown that people are willing to pay for more privacy. Now this privacy calculus is hard to determine and measure any type of gains from social interactions, even if we feel them. And also the concept of bounded rationality applies as does other cognitive biases. So if you remember from our discussion earlier, bounded rationality is the idea that we, when we reason about a decision, our reasoning is bounded by the limitations of what we can know. We don't have perfect information, say, about the losses and the gains. The diagram here, though, shows when we can make an attempt at measuring certain concepts we think are important here, sometimes statistically we can determine whether or not the hypotheses we have derived from a theory like this could be supported by, say, a survey. And also there's an important theory called privacy regulation. This was created by Erwin Altman in 1975. In their view, there's a temporal dynamic process of boundary negotiation that distinguishes privacy and publicity according to the circumstance. And you see here in this graphic, and I like to illustrate this in class, we have an implicit idea of boundary negotiation we consider what we think is our personal area near our body versus what is more like a public area that's beyond our body. This is different for different people and even across different cultures according to different studies. But in this graphic, you're seeing somebody holding out their arms and defining their personal area that way. We can also use our boundary negotiation in some ways to indicate our openness to social interaction, such as when we step closer. And we can use other types of techniques to indicate openness versus closeness, such as how we use our doors and walls, 
how we stand, and how we make eye contact. Now, this is idea of privacy, too, is contextual integrity. I apologize. It looks like we can't watch the video that's embedded on the screen. But this idea is conceived by Helen Nissenbaum in 2004. And she's published quite a bit and has videos that you can search for. I like this theory of privacy quite a bit because I find it very useful in the context of usable privacy and security. Information sharing under this theory is governed by the social norms of a different, of a given context. The norms of appropriateness, what information about persons is appropriate to reveal in a context, and the norms of distribution, movement of information from one party to another. You should remember both these norms. Privacy problems occur when information appropriate for one context is inappropriately shared in another. Online, users must judge context from perceived information flows, and that some examples of that might be streaming videos in public places, posting party photos on social media. And I'm sure you can also think of some things that have happened to you online or that you've interacted with that maybe would invoke whether or not you're co complying and conforming to these norms. Another important theory and framework is this privacy taxonomy for law and policy from Daniel Solov. And you see this diagram shows how invasions might impact a data subject on the left, but also that information is being collected processed by data holders, and then disseminated. And that at each step, there are certain privacy harms or privacy violations that might be invoked. Some examples are someone's ex-boyfriend uses access to a smart doorbell to secretly watch the person come and go. That is a privacy harm of surveillance. Or a political marketing firm combines public voter and property data with their mined social media data to identify how to target ads for an upcoming political campaign. Those are the concepts of aggregation and secondary use, which maybe is not quite a harm, but involves privacy questions at the least. Or a company markets a list of 5 million elderly incontinent women. That is potentially a privacy violation from disclosure. Or a hacker accesses someone's baby cam and sings creepy songs. That's not theoretical, that's actually happened. That's a privacy harm from intrusion. Change the defaults on your smart devices and sensors at home. Now, how do people manage privacy? Sometimes it's through our consumer choices, which project, products we buy, sites we use, and apps we download. We'll talk a little bit about how we're trying to help people make those choices more intelligently. We can also create privacy enhancing technologies, shortcut is PETs, such as new methods of authentication, encryption, and also anonymous browsing. The privacy settings too that you see on a social media site are part of how we help people manage their privacy. As our individual application interactions, such as the things you see to guide you when what you put things in a social media post or the information that you enter on a forum, and also, we all know and talk about coping behaviors, such as staying away from cameras, taking off a smartwatch when we don't want to be tracked, and perhaps being cryptic in an email, which is recording things electronically. In my lab, for instance, back at Carnegie Mellon, we worked on an intervention we called SafeSe, and that was actually to help surface some of your privacy and security settings, which were often buried in menus deep in an application. And we also provided social signals to help you decide what you should pick as a setting. For instance, some survey data that we collected about what the majority of people like certain uh, users would think about as the right or correct setting for that default. Well, thank you for listening. I'll see you in class.